May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives. Preserving the legacy of Shunyu Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable and free from economic hardship and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of do as little harm as possible. Today, I'm going to read uh, another, uh, a couple of uh, pieces uh, of a work in progress, Tassahara Stories, uh, in hopes that reading these pieces <laughs> will help me get through this, uh, which uh, uh, is a little hard because I'm doing too much, you know, doing all these podcasts and blogs and all sorts of other stuff, keeping track of all sorts of people. But I think it can be done, and uh, it's good to stay busy. (laughs) And um, uh, it's good to have something to do. Uh, It's nice to be not busy, actually. Uh, But... um, it's nice to it's nice to know what I want to do with my time. I always know. And then I really appreciate doing nothing, which is our basic practice. <laughs> Even doing nothing while we do something. So uh today uh I'm going to read you two pieces about Japanese uh teachers uh who we related to at Tassahara, uh, both of them Soto Zen priests, uh, Tozen Maizumi, known as Maizumi Roshi, and Togen Sumi, who we called Bishop Sumi, but he was Sumi Roshi. Uh, and uh, it'll, it'll tell you about them. You know, Maizumi was head of the L.A. Zen Center, the the founder of the uh, ZCLA. And, uh, but, you know, Tassara's stories tell us quite a bit about him. And uh, he's mentioned some in Crooked Cucumber. uh, But um, anyway, that's enough for now. So, uh, after pause to meditate, uh, I'll go right in to reading Maizumi and Sumi. Maizumi Taizan Maizumi came to the United States in 1956. He met Suzuki in 59, shortly after Suzuki arrived when Maizumi went up from L.A. to attend classes in English at San Francisco State College. Through the years, he'd go to Sokoji to visit and attend ceremonies. He'd talk to Miss 
he'd take Mrs. Suzuki out drinking, which she liked because her husband almost never drank alcohol or took her anywhere. Maizumi came from his L.A. Zen Center to Tassahara to help with the first month of the two-month first practice period. I'd met him before that in L.A., and he was friendly with me. I'd go to his cabin and ask him questions. He was generous with the little free time he had. I recall him telling me it's better to have a young teacher like him because the older ones get too kind and soft, like Suzuki. <laughs> I told him he didn't seem particularly fierce to me. He said that's because I'm not his student. I said, oh, then I better stick with Suzuki because I'm mainly here to have a good time. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> During his time at Tassahara's first practice period, <laughs> Maizumi gave a lecture and said something that Baker took exception to. Baker insisted that Maizumi publicly take it back, which he did. I can't remember what it was, but I remember the bad vibes. Oh, I think I remember what it was. I think uh, what it was, was, um, <laughs> I got a little rewrite coming here, huh? Uh, <laughs> what it was, was that Suzuki was to talk some, and then Maizumi was to talk, because Maizumi was helping him lead the first month of that practice period, which incidentally isn't mentioned in Crooked Cucumber, and... I think that was a a mistake or a fault of Crooked Cucumber was not giving Maizumi, you know, a little a little credit there in the the bit about the first practice period. So anyway, so Suzuki was <laughs> was talking, and you know the uh, you know he he went on longer than uh, maybe the his scheduled time and my zoomy like nudged him and went hey my turn or something like that i think that might have been it i know he did that which was really i mean he was way junior it was really out of place uh but suzuki went on and did it and graciously <laughs> uh, uh you know, turned the mic over to uh, my Zooming. And we all lived with it, but I think that's what Richard Baker couldn't live with and asked my Zoomy to publicly apologize for. Uh, yeah, he was down on my Zoomy. Uh, <laughs> all right. Back to what was written. Most people didn't notice anything special as they got older and mellower. Maizumi and Baker became friendly, and that's true. Maizumi's relation to the San Francisco Zen Center was not so good in the early years. He wanted to be affiliated with the uh, San Francisco Zen Center. Actually, it wasn't called San Francisco Zen Center yet, was it? No, it was just called the Zen Center, uh, somewhat because he felt no heart connection to the Soto Zen Temple in L.A., Zen Shuji. Shunyu Suzuki didn't respond to him on this. Richard Baker was very much against it. I met Maizumi in the fall of 1966, when I was in L.A. to visit a famous psychic I knew. Then and later, when I was on shopping trips, setting up the Tassahara dining room and buying stuff for the kitchen, I'd stay with Maizumi and sit with him in the morning. 
He didn't have many students yet. That first fall morning after Zazen and breakfast, he sat me down opposite him at a low table and ranted at me for an hour about the fact that not only would Richard Baker not allow the L.A. Zen Center to be associated with the Zen Center in San Francisco, but there was not even a mention of his center in the Windbell, the uh, Zen Center's publication. Uh, he had worked hard to get a Zazen group going in L.A., had gotten no support for starting one at Zen Shuji, the Soto Zen Temple for Japanese Americans. He implored me to try to get just one sentence in the wind bell about his center. I mentioned it to the appropriate people when I got back, and maybe it was going to happen anyway, but in the January-February wind bell, there was a good notice about him and his group with schedule, address, and phone number, and mentioned that he'd helped Suzuki out early on. Maizumi had a Caucasian-American wife whose name was Charlene. She was a Nichiren priest. She introduced me to organic liquid soap for cleaning just about anything, Basic H. I later became a Basic H salesman in order to get a big discount on it for Tassahara. We bought it by the 55-gallon drum. In 1965, a young man named Bob Halpern had encouraged Maizumi to start a Zen center in L.A. Bob had been one of his first students. Bob said that at times he and a few others would be sitting downstairs while Maizumi and Charlene were yelling and breaking furniture over each other's heads upstairs. <laughs> Bob has a gift for hyperbole. <laughs> Charlene came to the Zen Center a few times, saying she was seeking refuge from her husband. There were many troubles in his early years. When Maizumi was at Tassahara for that first practice period, he asked Bob if he'd come help him with a session. Bob told me Suzuki refused for permission for him to go, and told Bob that if he didn't think there had already been a change, he should try to reflect on how incredibly arrogant he was when he first showed up. I'd say that's also Bob's hyperbole. Maizumi was a gracious host. In 1973, my soon-to-be first wife, Diane, and I dropped by the ZCLA to say hello to Maizumi and were told by a gaggle of students waiting at his doorstep that he was on his way from the airport, having just visited his home temple in Japan. When he showed up, he invited just the two of us inside. <laughs> uh, we sat on tatami and talked and drank sake and nibbled on Japanese snacks he'd brought with him, and he and I drank and drank, and we all yacked it up for the longest time. Diane didn't know she was pregnant yet, but had good instincts and just had tea and water. I felt bad for his students waiting to see him, but he said not to worry and treated us like there was nothing in the world he'd rather do then hang out. He was between marriages then, and he said he was alone and needed to unwind a little from his trip with some people who weren't students. Sumi Togen Sumi arrived in 1965 and became the chief priest at Zen Shuji in L.A. and the bishop of Soto Zen in America, filling the vacancy left by Reiren Yamada. That didn't mean anything special to us Zazen students who hadn't yet learned the meaning of respecting our elders. To us, the old Japanese Soto Zen establishment was just some church trip 
a formality that Suzuki had to deal with. But to me, Sumi's visits were fun and educational. Sumi being bishop, he'd come to officiate some ceremonies in San Francisco, mainly with the Japanese-American congregation, but he'd lead the services for us, too, when he was there. Suzuki, who had declined the time-consuming role of bishop from the time he'd arrived in America, always treated Sumi with deference. We all liked Sumi. He was friendly and smiled a lot. I don't think that Katagiri liked him. He grimaced when he heard Sumi was coming. He didn't seem to like any Japanese Zen big shots. Yes, I sigh and reflect. Togen Sumi. Mm. Dare I tell what I remember of him? At Tassahara, I quickly became someone who dealt with guests. I went beyond the call of duty, however. Since I was an overly friendly and talkative Texan, I tended to meet just about anyone who came down the road, and Sumi was no exception. In the late spring of 1967, when we were getting Tassahara going, he brought his nephew with him, and they stayed in one of the stone rooms. Suzuki would ask Sumi to give a talk when he came and would introduce him with respect, treating him like some great Zen master. I remember taking Sumi on a walk up the hogback and showing him the waterfall across the ravine. He taught me then one of my first Japanese words, taki, waterfall. Sumi was nice, but he was also smarmy, with a big toothy smile. He was thin, tall for a Japanese, and gangly. I kept thinking he looked like Dracula. He'd invite me to his room. Being alone with him gave me a little tingling fear that soon he'd have his fangs in my neck. Ominous feelings of danger have always had a certain allure for me, though. I met his nephew, who was an artist, who complained to me on a walk to Grasshopper Flats about what a tyrant Sumi was over him, making him sit Zazen and follow the schedule at Tassara, which he wasn't interested in. He also told me he wasn't really Sumi's nephew. <laughs> <laughs> Sumi had years of training and discipline in the Soto Zen realm, and I think that anyone who can put up with all the demands of that training and that outfit deserves some respect. I learned from being around him and listening to the few lectures I heard him give. I remember a lecture Sumi gave about the Sixth Patriarch Sutra, where he said that the bad guy in that story wasn't all wrong. Um, in the famous Zen story, the fifth patriarch asked disciples for poems to express their understanding to help him choose a successor. Shin Sui posted a poem about wiping the mirror mind clean of dust. Illiterate rice washer Hui Ning had the poem read to him and dictated another one, saying, There was no mirror, dust, etc. It all was empty. So he got the robe and bowl, and is the hero of the story. The point of the lecture that Sumi gave was that Shin Sui's understanding was also good, that the practice of wiping the mind clean is also important, that purification and transcendence are not mutually exclusive. Later, he sent me letters and gifts, such as a sheet of stamps, some of which I could use to write him letters. He asked me to visit him when I came to L.A. While doing research on food and material sources for the Tassahara kitchen and dining room, I called Sumi from my Zumi's home in Zindo, where I was staying. He invited me to lunch. We met at a Japanese restaurant. He brought 
two young American students whom he introduced as his disciples. We ate and talked and had a charming time. He asked me if I'd like to stay at Zenshuji, and when I said I had a place to stay, invited me over for the evening, but I said my schedule was full. When he went to the bathroom, his students immediately grabbed me and begged me to ask if they could come shopping with me. I did, and Sumi said okay. He went off, and they joined me, driving here and there. The first thing we did was to get some ice cream. Both these guys were in their early 20s and had come to Zen Shuji independently just because it was a Zen temple and they read about Zen and enlightenment and wanted to get enlightened. No one had recommended it. John had studied in Stockton with McDonough whom he called McDonough Roshi. He'd stayed with McDonough for far too long, he said, and had found it to be a bizarre and unrewarding experience. I asked him why he stayed so long if his experience was so bad. He said that he thought that the problem must be his and kept at it till he finally got physically ill and had to leave. So then he went to L.A. and discovered Zen Shuji and Sumi. John had been there a while when the other fellow came to the door. He said that Sumi normally shooed away enlightenment sinking Westerners, but since they were both insistent, he had accepted them. This seemed to be in accordance with the Zen tradition of telling prospective monks to go away till they'd sit steadily outside the temple gate for some days or weeks. That's the origin of the Tangario practice. I asked them what their schedule was like, and they said that Sumi made them get up early in the dark and sit Zazen for a couple of hours and that he'd have them join him for a morning service, and he made them eat mainly white rice and miso soup alone, and told them not to talk, and would have them clean the temple and copy Chinese characters for hours <laughs> in a small dark room. They had no idea what the characters meant or how to write them. He gave them only a moment's instruction, and they didn't know about stroke order or the meaning of what they were writing. A few weeks later, I returned, and after lunch, he let them go with me again, and they were like crazed hermits come down from the mountains, ravenous for sweets and conversation. They said that they hadn't been out since I was there, that I was the only person that Sumi would let them be with or talk to. They said He'd put them through a grueling seven-day session with morning to night zazen and never <laughs> join them except to come in and hit them with the stick. <laughs> they implored me to return soon when we parted. The next time I returned and there was only John. The other fellow had left. John said that Sumi had given him a koan. Koans are not typically given by Soto Zen priests, but there is a long tradition in Soto Zen of studying them. Dogen, Soto Zen's founder, had completed koan study when he was a Rinzai monk, and he wrote tons about them. Suzuki frequently gave lectures on koans, mainly from the Blue Cliff Records, but I was most intrigued that Togen Sumi had actually given John a koan to practice with. I urged him to tell me more. He said that he had accompanied Sumi to the home of a wealthy lay family in order to assist in a memorial service. This is one of the principal tasks of Japanese priests. The home was a good hour drive from Zenshuji, so Sumi suggested that they stay in a motel for the evening. John thought that was great because it would give him more time to be with his teacher and maybe he could glean some insight 
that had, up to then, eluded him. That night, when it was time for bed, Sumi confirmed John's assumption and said that it was good for <laughs> Good for master and disciple to be close to each other. But John was a little taken aback when Sumi said, as he pulled back the covers of one of the queen beds, that this meant that they should sleep in the same bed. John said he slept better by himself, but Sumi insisted on leaving no blanket unturned in pursuing the course of being mind to mind and body to body. Maybe this does make sense, John thought. Sumi then said that they should have no clothing between them and, as he disrobed, told John to do the same. John felt resistance arising within him, but labeled that as a barrier between him and the enlightenment he sought. Don't resist, he thought. Say yes to the master. If you don't obey, you'll never break through to a realization of Buddha mind. What a dedicated student you are, I said. Please go on. Alone and naked, they stood in the motel room facing each other. Sumi told John that he was going to give him a koan. A koan? asked John with eager anticipation. Yes, a koan, and this is the greatest of all koans. This koan, he said, is called the diamond koan. He told John that if he penetrated this great koan, that he would know the mind of the Buddhas and the patriarchs. Are you ready, he asked. Yes, I am ready, John answered trembling with excitement and awe that his long months of torturous Zen practice had brought him to this moment with the promise of breaking through his ego to the infinite. With that, Sumi reached forward and grabbed John's penis and testicles. John took it as a classic example of the unexpected act from an enlightened master and sloughed off the instinctive quiver of revulsion, he breathed heavily and called out bravely, It's Buddha! No, he thought, and Sumi fondled his pride, it's not good enough. It's no mind. Moo! The oak tree in the garden. He kept trying to give incisive, non-conceptual, intuitive Zen answers to the koan, but nothing seemed to work. Finally, he realized that he'd failed, and he didn't want Sumi to be touching him anymore, so he pulled back. Don't give up, said Sumi. I give up, said John. And he went to the other bed, crawled in, and pulled the covers over his head. I asked John what his take on it all was now. I mean, I said, don't you think that maybe he was just horny? Yes, yeah, sure, I guess so, he told me. He said it wasn't the first indication he'd had of Sumi's predilections. He said that the reason his fellow student had left was what had happened to another Westerner that Sumi had taken in. I said I thought that Sumi sent them all away, and John said that was true, but that this fellow had come to him saying that he was plagued by fears that he had homosexual tendencies and that Sumi had taken him in and seduced him, and that the guy had gone berserk and had to be taken to a mental hospital. So I told John a story that I knew about Sumi, one that had been told to me by my Zumi. My Zumi didn't get along with Sumi or with Yamada, the bishop before him, the main reason was that Maizumi didn't want to spend his life being a temple priest for family ceremonies and all, and wanted to offer daily zazen to Zenshuji members and Westerners, and neither Yamada nor Sumi were interested in that and wanted him to do lots of ceremonies and temple duties, and they wanted to lord it over him. Maizumi got sick of the scene there, and had been on his own for a few years. He told me that 
he nevertheless helped Sumi out with important ceremonies and events, and that they had to deal with each other about various issues. The most divisive, he said, was that he wanted a Zendo to be sanctioned as an official temple by the Soto sect. He told me that he and Sumi used to have yelling, screaming arguments with each other in which Sumi would threaten him with one thing or another, expelling him from America or whatever. Maizumi said that he'd yell back at Sumi that his connections were more powerful in Japan than Sumi's and that he could get Sumi on some sort of shit list. He said it was all a bunch of stupid, empty, petty threats, but that the main thing was that they had a very unpleasant relationship and that he couldn't get what he wanted from Sumi or get Sumi out of his hairlessness. Then one night he got a call. It was very late, so late you'd call it early. Sumi was breathing heavily and his voice was shaky. He asked Maizumi if he would come to the police station to bail him out. He couldn't get out on his own. Maizumi drove straight to the police station and soon Sumi appeared before him in drag. As Maizumi drove back to Zenshuji, Sumi clutched his dress and sobbed loudly and so wetly that his mascara ran down blending with his pancake makeup and his lipstick was all smeared. He ran into the temple crying and holding his high heels. He was probably worried that Maizumi would tell on him to Zenshuji's Japanese-American congregation. Japanese-Americans back then were a very conservative group. Not puritanical like mainstream America, but more conservative in many ways, and according to my sources, more so than Japanese in Japan. Katagiri's wife Tomoe, called Issei, the first generation of Japanese in America, Meiji. The Meiji imperial era ended in 1912. I've had gay friends tell me that Japanese aren't homophobic, and I've told them that Japanese don't snoop, but they can only continue to believe the average Japanese isn't homophobic as long as they don't let on that they're gay. In my adult English conversation class in Okayama back in the early 90s, I brought up the topic of AIDS and safe sex. A housewife said, we won't have AIDS in Japan because we don't have homosexuals. Sumi's predilections weren't totally unknown to others. Once Richard Baker accompanied Shunyu Suzuki to a meeting of Soto Zen priests in L.A., at some point they were walking by a window on a staircase landing and caught sight of Sumi passionately making out with another man in a car below. Suzuki <laughs> Suzuki quickly turned his head while saying, too much, too much. So, that's my Zumi and Sumi. Mm. You know, one thing I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of, well, is it all right for me to bring up stuff that happened later, you know, or should I just stick with telling what was happening at that time? Uh, and then maybe have a, uh, a, a, a a part in the book afterwards where 
I sort of, you know, what happened after then. And I think, well, yeah, maybe, but, you know, there's going to be so many characters in it. I think, I don't think anybody can keep up but me. Uh, so I'm sort of thinking, no, I don't know. And also there's the other point that you don't have to say everything. You know, uh, that's uh, that's why it's good for me to work with uh, brutal editors. Uh, it was like, it was like, if I were a sculptor, I'd just bring out a big block, and then the editor would force me to carve it down into, uh, you know, a statue of David or whatever. Not me, David. Uh, but anyway, let, let me look in there and see if there's anything else to comment on. Yeah, I, um, you know, my my plan was just to read it straight and note where to comment. But when I got to the thing about, uh, oh, very right near the first of the Mizumi part, where it said there was something happened that Richard Baker made him apologize for, I realized I remembered what that was, probably because of going through some interview or something since then, or who knows what. Uh, and remember that thing about him <laughs> uh, telling Suzuki, hey, your time's up, my turn. <laughs> uh, and uh, But mainly I'm going to try to just read it as it is, and then if... There's stuff I've learned uh, to comment later. It's sort of like breaking the fourth wall. I don't really like breaking the fourth wall. You know, somebody said, oh, in audiobooks, I really like it when the, when the author who's reading it says, oh, yeah, this was a really hard part, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't know. I, I think I'd, I'd rather go in the opposite direction and and have the author not be there uh the and uh just to have the story you know you want to maximize the the flow the hypnotic quality whatever but i don't know you can go either way uh all right let's see oh yeah i say i say sfzc hmm Oh, some of these things, you know, I learn them and then I forget them. It was Z Zen Center at first, and then it became the San Francisco Zen Center later. And, you know, in all my notes, I've got all this down, but I say SFCC. Uh, was it San Francisco Zen Center by then? I can't remember. Uh, and does it matter? Uh, couldn't I just say... I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you're going to, if I just say Zen Center, that's what we always said. And then identified if it's another Zen Center. If I just say Zen Center, it's San Francisco. And if it's another Zen Center, like LA Zen Center, I say LA Zen Center. That's another way to do it. Oh, yeah, that basic age. Yeah. You know, I went to the basic age headquarters, which was in like somewhere like near Berkeley, in, in Emeryville, uh, you know, near the approach to the Golden Gate Bridge coming from Richmond, say. Uh, and um, I just drove up to the building one day and because I was, you know, uh, uh, coming back, going back to the city or something. And I talked to the vice president. Somehow I got through. And I told him that uh, I had I was a basic eight salesman, but I basically did it for one community. And I said, I have looked at all your your material selling it, and none of it makes a point that is good for the environment. You know that it breaks down quick, that it's organic, etc. And um, I said, really, that's going to be a big deal, and, and you should promote it that way. 
And he thanked me very much. I didn't even, I didn't even, you know, I didn't even uh, ask for credit or leave my name and say, demand a finder's fee, <laughs> anything like that. I, I remember that. Um, you know what we noticed at Tatsahara, though, that uh, when people would say, oh, you know, you can't put all this stuff in the creek. And, and we were. We were letting, uh, you know, our dishwashing soap, which was like that, going to the creek. Uh, then we got a septic tank eventually. But when, but when it was just coming out the back at first, uh, the, there was just an explosion of growth there. So maybe it was one of those things with, uh, you know, one of the problems with... Uh, uh, laundry detergents and dishwashing soaps and stuff was, uh, God, what was it called? The stuff that made things grow too much. I can't remember. Okay. Well, I just went through it, and I think that the uh, rest of it sort of speaks for itself. So, um, okay, so that is uh, this week's contribution to Tasa are stories. Um, don't expect a lot of other chapters to be like that. <laughs> uh, although there is some uh, unpleasant, shocking material uh, that we will hit upon. I'd say this was, to me, pleasant, shocking material. <laughs> okay. You know, we here at Cuke Archives are eager to get through with Tassara stories, with the work we're doing on Shinya Suzuki lectures, with uh, uh, coming out with an audio book based on the podcast of Reading Crooked Cucumber, a second edition, maybe, uh, if they'll go for it. Uh, but I'm going to do a second edition of Crooked Cucumber one way or another. It'll be online, if anything, if nothing else. Uh, so um, I would like to thank our sponsor for making this possible, making it possible for us to continue. So I would like to thank you, dear listeners, <laughs> because you're our sponsor. <laughs> That's how we get by. Let me tell you, so far, ain't no money from publishing uh, that's uh, doing more than, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, it helps a little, but not enough to survive or even get near surviving. Uh, so we appreciate it. We, we do appreciate it when... Uh, you go to the donate page. You get to it by going to the homepage of cuke.com, C-U-K-E.com, and hit the donate link up near top or the bottom. You go to the donate page, shows you how to send a check or make a PayPal donation or become a PayPal subscriber for as little as $1 a month. We do appreciate your support, and it's easy to do. This has been a Cuke Audio podcast. I'm DC, Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog at Bandita, Feline, Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka. We're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. Mm -hmm.